Welcome back to the Cross Border Interviews with Christopher Brown, our special live Tuesday edition where we bring in the candidate for political office and we talk to them about politics, their party, and why they've decided to run. And we have brought in a former guest of the show, and she is here, and I'm proud to have her in studio today. That is the current, I want to make sure I get this right here, people, the current candidate for the Alberta Party for the riding of Calgary Elbow, Carrie Kendall. Carrie, thank you so much for doing this. <laughs> Hey, thanks, Chris. It's good to see you again. So, Carrie, you've been on the show before. You know every question that starts <laughs> off every one of these uh, interviews is, where does your sense of duty to serve come from? Yeah, that's, um, you know, I, we've spoken in the past about this as well. And for me, the duty to serve certainly comes from family. Now, my family is not involved. I don't come from a political family. Uh, no one's ever served office as far as I'm aware, uh, no grandparents, no parents. Um, but the duty to serve though, to serve people, um, certainly through the church community when I was a kid. Uh, my home was always open to everybody. Um, so my parents, we would have, you know, people from out of town that would stay at our home, uh, relatives, uh, friends, acquaintances, anytime somebody needed a place to stay, um, our home was always open. and. Um, you know, we would serve in soup kitchens and all kinds of things. So, so the duty to serve certainly started at home and the living, breathing example of my, my parents. I was taught the importance of, of being kind and, and serving others. Now, you have an extensive resume. Like, if you, we could spend a full hour just on your resume alone. But I, we want to talk, because this is the live political edition of the show, about your political involvement. You have decided in 2022, I was at the nomination yeah, meeting or the, the, the acclamation meeting, I should say, because you were the only candidate, uh, to put your name forward for the Alberta Party in the riding of Calgary Elbow, once held by former MLA Greg Clark, the former leader of the party. Uh, I want to start off with why now? Why did you decide to put your name forward in 2023 for this upcoming election? Yeah, I mean, you know, the, the expression goes, every every election is important, and this one is a crossroads, et cetera. Um, as, as you may know, I've been working for several years with the Immigration Refugee Board as a tribunal member, so making decisions on, on people's claims. And so I had to resign from that position. That was a, that was a really big decision. I, I really enjoy the work that I've been doing in refugee law and, and getting the opportunity to meet people, hundreds if not thousands of people from all over the world in the work that I do. Uh, now, I think the urgency that I, I felt is that we are even more so at a crossroads. And I think one of the things that I've observed over the last couple of years during the pandemic is, again, this increase in polarization, this idea that it's either or, that we only have two options, two voices in the legislature. And so I think more than ever, I see a space and I see a need um, to bring another voice, a more independent uh, voice to that conversation. So I am, I'm a diplomat by nature. I'm always looking you know, to problem solve, to collaborate, to find the wins, to find the common ground. And more than ever, I think we need that kind of um, leadership, that kind of service um, in, our, in our legislature, in our government. So yeah, now, now more than ever, I think we, we need that because it's, it was divisive last time and it's, I anticipate that it's going to be uh, as divisive, if not more, uh, so in the 2023 election. It, or fall 2022, we'll see what happens. You, you talked about independence. You talked about that independence, that third party voice in the legislature. Now you've chosen to run for the Alberta party. Uh, they did have seats in the last sitting, but now they do not. Um, what was it about the Alberta Party that drew you and your independent spirit to the Alberta Party to run under uh, now leader Barry Morishita, but also in the riding of Calgary Elbow? Yeah, so we're really fortunate. Uh, when people say, you know, you're running as an underdog, even my daughter has asked me, you know, why do you always pick these big challenges? You're the underdog, this party has no seats, et cetera, et cetera. Well, it is possible, and, and I know it's possible, and we, we had, as you've already mentioned, uh, MLA Greg Clark, who served as the Alberta Party MLA for Calgary Elbow. And I live in Marta Loop, and so Marta Loop is also a community that's in Calgary Elbow. And part of the inspiration is Greg's service. He brought that independent voice. And when I say independent, I mean a critical thinker. I mean somebody who's a principled pragmatist, which is what I consider myself. 
and people say, well, well what does that mean? I've, I've been asked, what's a principled pragmatist? Yep, that's literally was going to be my next question. <laughs> and so what, what that means is, look, I know my core values, and so does Greg Clark. You know the lines in the sands. And one of the core values is the equality and dignity of each person. So there are hills that are worth standing up for and saying, look, this is a line that can't be crossed. And as Greg Clark used to say, and, and, and I will still continue to say, the Alberta party is a big tent with hard walls. And what that means, the hard walls, means there's no room for hate or intolerance. And the big tent part means there's lots of room for passionate, civil, critical uh, debate, and, and especially when we disagree. So one of the things that I'm passionate about with the Alberta Party is it is that space, and Barry Morishita also holds these values, by the way, which is another reason. If, if the party was going in a different direction, I would not have stepped up. But Barry Morishita is uh, very similar in, in leadership style to Greg Clark, um, and very much that big tent with hard walls, that uh, principled pragmatism. So the principled part is know your core values, know your lines in the sand, um, which, which I do and Greg Clark also does. And then, and then the pragmatic part is, look, you gotta be open-minded. We're living in a world of accelerating changes. And so, you know, you can't, good ideas can come from just about anywhere. And so you've got to assess these ideas on the merit. And so rather than, you know, one of the things that discourages me from, from the titans in the arena is they're awash in their millions and there's a small handful of people controlling things uh, in a very top-down hierarchical way. And I'm just not interested in that kind of um, governance or, or that kind of politics. And, and so, yeah, in the Alberta Party, we say, look, we're going to do things differently. And it starts with how we campaign. It starts with how we build policy. And I love what Greg Clark did, and I love what Barry Morishita is doing. We start with listening to understand. And that is very different than what I see other politicians and parties doing. They start with a position, and they listen to rebut uh, what the other person or the opposition is saying, rather than listening to understand uh, in the first place. One of the things that I found interesting at your, um, at your meeting um, which was literally, I think, two weeks ago, yeah, two and a half exactly. weeks ago, um, was Barry announcing, and I had not heard him talk about this beforehand, was there was going to be no whip votes in your caucus. So if elected, you'd be able to truly represent what your constituents want at the table, and you'd be able to bring forward ideas to the table for the Alberta Party to help understand direct policy. Do we need that in today's society? Because we see polar opposites in parties right now with the UCP and the NDP and maybe a top-down approach from both parties and that's my words if you want to send negative comments please send it to me <laughs> Carrie's not putting those words in my mouth I am so do we need a, a third option that is more independent and more constituent oriented than what we're seeing right now with the other two and I, I say I don't want to say mainstream parties but the two current parties that are in the legislature. Yeah, I, I think there is a need for that. And, you know, Barry and I have also had conversations about, you know, f for him, he's seeking to be elected by the people of Brooks Medicine Hat. I'm seeking to be elected and to earn the trust and the votes of the people in Calgary Elbow. And the issues uh, that are really important to people in Calgary Elbow may not always be exactly the same as the people living in Brooks Medicine Hat. And, and you can just, you can already imagine some of the, the differences of flood mitigation. I mean, Greg Clark was a champion for flood mitigation and with, with all the rainfall recently, that's again, top of mind for people. As you know, the Elbow River flows right <laughs> right through Calgary <laughs> Elbow. Um, and and so, you know, I think it's really important and, and local businesses. I mean, I live in Marta Loop. And so we have so many local businesses throughout the riding of Calgary Elbow. And so I'm really passionate and Greg Clark was as well to advocate, be a champion, because local businesses are actually the largest, create most of the jobs. And I don't think we always think about that. We, we see sometimes the parties are at least perceived as champions for either big industry or, or unions or, or other groups. Um, so I'm, I'm excited about being able to truly listen to, to neighbors and the residents of Calgary Elbow and to listen and understand their priorities, their concerns, and then to truly, not just a transactional one-off, you know, right before an election, 
But, you know, if, if I'm elected as the MLA, it will be about building long-term relationships, continuing conversations over that period of four years in office so that people have direct access and an ongoing relationship with their representative. And I think that's also uh, missing in a lot of cases. In, and so I'm really excited that Barry is, is so passionate about providing that local kind of um, service to constituents uh, that I think is all it is needed right now. You talked about the current weather phenomenon that we are currently having, and a lot of people are hearkening it back to the 2013 flood. Calgary Albo, Calgary Glenmore, the downtown core was one of the most affected areas in that uh, time. Now, uh, the previous government, this government, have tried to work towards uh, mitigating that issue, but government takes time it's not something that has happened overnight even though we are now currently potentially we're under a state of a emergency as of recording this how are the people of calgary elbow doing right now because i can imagine that there's a lot of not flashbacks but a lot of hesitation that what they saw in 13 might be happening now because of the amount of rainfall we are seeing yeah it's it's distressing Chris, there's, you know, there's, there was a loss of life in the 2013 floods. People lost their homes. So it's a very distressing, and, and it is bringing back very distressing memories um, for people. And, you know, in this time, people are doing things like making sure any valuables or anything that could, could be water damaged out of their basements are brought to higher level. Um, so people, I think, are already taking action just, just in case. Um, my understanding is is that the Spring Bank, uh, Spring Bank Dry Reservoir um, just started construction here in 2022. So you're right, some of these things have taken much longer um, um, than anticipated perhaps. And so I know right now that with the Glenmore um, Reservoir that they've made sure that there's increased uh, capacity for overflow. So I think, you know... Natural disasters, you know, viruses, they don't know politics. They don't care about politics. This is about people. And, and so I think when it comes to things like preparing for, uh, you know, climate crisis kinds of um, impact, whether it be floods or droughts or whatever we're facing, let's get the politics out of it. Let's listen to people with the expertise, people with the lived experience, and let's take action as soon as possible. Um, so we do, we need to be thoughtful we need to have real consultation with with people who are impacted, um, including the people in, in Spring Springbank as well. I mean, that was one of the challenges last time, and even with this project, is making sure that there's proper consultation. Um, and then, of course, you know, for my neighbors and, and communities in Calgary Elbow, uh, make sh- making sure that they know that their representatives are taking action. And you know, one of the things that, as distressing and horrible as it was. It also brought people together in 2013. You know, we all stepped up. People were volunteering. People were helping. All orders of government, um, you know, were stepping up. And and it it wasn't just lip service. People really cared. And and people were actually helping clean out basements and and helping their neighbors. And so that was encouraging to see. I I know we're here to talk about politics, but you've brought up a good statement and I want to get your uh, honest response to it. Why do you think we unify in times of disasters and not during times when there's not really things going on? Because like you said, in 2013, after the the floods, people came together. They rallied around their neighbors. Mm -hmm. They were able to come together for a common good. Um, right now we are seeing a polarization of our politics, of our society, whether it be through COVID, whether it be through other things. Why, why do you think when, when push comes to shove, neighbors help neighbors at the end of the day? Is it because we're honestly a good group of people as Calgarians or yeah. is there another underlying thing that I'm not I'm seeing right now? I think there's a couple things. I think there's, there's truth in what you said. I mean, I believe in the good in people and I believe in giving people the benefit of the doubt. I don't start from a position that everybody's just evil if, if they're not on the same team as me. That's nonsense. Um, most people, as you know, are not members of any political party. Um, so, but why do people come together in, in difficult times? I think what often happens when we're faced with these existential, really big crises or big problems is it puts us in a space where we get perspective very quickly. Um, we, we don't take things for granted in the same way that we do when times are good. So when we're faced with really difficult life circumstances, we start to think about 
what's most important, you know, and, and obviously, you know, thinking about loved ones, thinking about relationships, family, friends, I think in times of crisis, we think about that sort of human connection and, and relationships. And so I think that's in part why we see this outpouring of, of goodness from people during these really difficult times, because as a society and as a group of people, we start to see a big picture again. It's, it's easy when things, when times are good to forget what's most important. And I think when times are bad, it gives us an opportunity to reflect. I appreciate your honesty on that. And I apologize for throwing that left field. It's just, you, you, you said something and I just wanted to make sure that I, 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 I like these conversations where we can just go off on a tangent from time to time, but I want to bring us back to your run for the Alberta party and your run for Calgary elbow. Now, you are you were going to be up against a former sitting minister, but he uh, Doug Schweitzer, the uh, MLA for Calgary Elbow, has announced that he is not seeking re-election. Um, while you're probably not worried about who the MLA or the UCP candidate or the NDP candidate is, you're out there door knocking, you're out there talking to uh, the people you want to vote for you. What are you hearing? What are you hearing about the way this government's been handling things? What are you hearing about the issues on the ground of Calgary Elbow? Is it the Spring Bank? Is it other issues that are more hyper-local than the big picture of Alberta politics? Yeah, no, I, I think, well, one of the things that I'm, I'm hearing, uh, people are concerned, uh, namely about economic recovery and what that looks like. People are still uh, reeling from from the difficulties of the last two years. It's, it's not over. People are still very concerned about where we're at in this, un we're in a very uncertain space. Uh, uncertain in, in terms of the implications of COVID and where we're at now, and also very uncertain in terms of what economic recovery looks like. And this hybrid model of, of you know, people have started their own businesses, they're working from home, they're now starting to work outside of the home, and it's a mix. So certainly the things I'm hearing are still related to economic issues and what economic recovery for all looks like. As, as you may know, um, women are uh, disproportionately impacted by the pandemic and, and child care and, and responsibilities and, and re-entering the workforce and loss of jobs during the pandemic. And so what does economic recovery look like um, for women? And so as, as you also know, I'm very passionate about women in leadership, women in government, women in, in business. And Should we talk about the button on here? Because anyone who knows, I'm a button fan. So know, whenever I'll, someone I'll walks into my... I'll have to leave this button with you maybe when I go. You can add it to your collection, which is but amazing, by the way. You're, you're part, you were one of the, if I'm not mistaken, partially co-founders of Ask Her here in Calgary. Yeah. Um, why is it important to have more women in, and I, I, I don't, I'm not trying to be misogynist when I say that people, please accept my apologies. I'm not trying to come off. It's just an honest question. Why is it important for more women to be in leadership roles? Yeah. So I think first of all, more women in leadership roles will help with decision-making. And what I mean by that, it's not just because we're half of the population. Um, it's also because some of the most qualified, brightest, most competent people who should be there. And I'll do a shout out right now for my buddy Najwan, who is also was part of Ask Her and is running in, in Calgary Glenmore. Look, I'm not too worried about parties per se, but we need women to, and I'm also really excited about all the women stepping up to run for leadership of, of the uh, UCP as well, by the way. So it's not about women just because we're women. It's because we add value to the decision-making uh, role. It helps with blind spots. It helps with things that are really important to women, like policies around or legislation around childcare, supporting economic recovery. And look at it, when we include women in economic recovery and policy making, we all win. This is a win-win for everybody. Um, so yeah, so a plug for Ask Her for sure. And I also plug for Madam Premier. Um, you know, also a local um, owned business by a, a woman here in Calgary. So, and then Sophie Grace is the blazer. So you look at, you know, we have incredible women leaders in Calgary and I am really happy to support uh, women in, in business and entrepreneurs and, and women in government. So it is something that I'm, I'm passionate about and have spent several years, uh, time, energy and money trying to not only ask women, but support women financially support them in very tangible ways door knocking electing hosting fundraisers i mean there's lots of ways where in a very practical way we can uh, support women uh, in leadership 
Now, one of the uh, biggest issues that have happened over the last three years is COVID-19. Now, I, I don't want to go on the continue on this path, but uh, I, it's the elephant in the room that people have been talking about for the last few days. And that is the UCP's government, Jason Kenney's government, decided to lift and move on to stage three of the uh, reopening of Alberta. That is, if you have COVID, you are no longer required to mandatorily yeah. uh, uh, what's isolate. The word? isolate yeah. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Isolate yourself. Um, there is a divide in this province, whether you agree that that's the right move or don't agree with mm-hmm. that's the right move. What's your opinion on us, the province of Alberta, moving into the next stage? Because there's a lot of businesses right now who are, have been struggling for the last two years and might see that as a welcome sign to say, okay, our workers are going to get back to work. Mm-hmm. We are going to get potentially open more hours here. Mm-hmm. We're going to have a great summer with Calgary Stampede coming up. What's your opinion on the stage three reopening of yeah. the COVID-19 measures? You know, hindsight's twenty twenty, and, and certainly uh, not just myself, but many others have had really serious concerns about the management of the COVID pandemic over the last couple of years. I think one of the examples, someone who I thought was doing a better job communicating and making sure citizens understood uh, what the challenges are and then taking appropriate action, and including, you know, isolating if, if you have COVID, was the, the Prime Minister of New Zealand. Um, Jacinda Ardern, she's been excellent right from the very beginning. And I think that's been part of the challenge and part of the issue right from the beginning is not having a cohesive, coherent communication from our leadership on this so that people could make good decisions, informed decisions. And just like we were talking about earlier, believing in the good in people. I mean, even if it's not COVID, if, if we're really sick with something that's really contagious, it makes sense to me as a human being to make sure that I don't infect other people and that I stay home so I don't infect my colleagues. I mean, sometimes it's just common sense. And, and just as we were saying earlier, Chris, viruses don't know politics. <laughs> you know, and I think what's been unfortunate about the whole process has been doing what's expedient, doing what's reactionary in terms of what the the perceived mood of the people is, you know, rather than listening to uh, experts, whether they be virologists, immunologists, listening to healthcare professionals on the front lines, nurses, doctors, I think if I had to see or or underscore sort of what a, a common thread or the most difficult challenge over the last couple years has been the erosion of trust. Um, and the failure to meaningfully consult with people who know better, have more expertise. Um, So for example, uh, one of the things that I I love about what Alberta Party leader Barry Morishita is doing is really emphasizing that we're going to start by trusting Albertans. And that means on healthcare, on on issues around the pandemic, trusting uh, healthcare experts, you know, people that have studied this for, for decades. Um, so that's that would be very different, I think, in, in terms of, of managing that, that, that I would support. And again, you know, this is a little bit off topic, but I think it's also important, is trusting Albertans when it comes to, you know, educators. Let's trust uh, el- educators in Alberta to help make decisions on curriculum and where we go with that. So I, I think in this opening phase, we have to be cautious. And I think we can do a better job of making sure people have good information I have felt, even as a citizen over these last couple of years, that I was trying to get information from other sources because I had concerns about perhaps the reliability or the transparency of what was being shared with me as a citizen. And that's not, that's not what's best. It, we, we talked about small businesses at the mm-hmm. beginning of this, and those have been the hardest hit during the pandemic. Mm-hmm. Um, Calgary Elbow has a large small business population. Mm -hmm. Uh, A lot of people live in there and work downtown as well. Um, How do you envision yourself working with small businesses to ensure the proper recovery? Because a lot of small businesses have struggled and they're trying to find a light at the end of the tunnel. And this might be it. Who knows what it is actually. But in your words... How, do, how does the Alberta Party and you as the next MLA for Calgary Elbow help small businesses thrive, but also help small businesses 
be solve uh, ha- be competitive again because they were before this uh, mm-hmm. uh, COVID nineteen pandemic. Now, mm-hmm. big box stores are working better, mm-hmm. but the small businesses aren't. Yeah. So, so as you know, some businesses didn't make it uh, because of the pandemic and had to shut their doors. Um, you know, I have friends who own local businesses uh, in Martelloup, for example. A good friend, Richard, owns the Garrison Pub. And some of the things that I'm hearing, especially from uh, restaurant owners, was the real challenges, again, back to this idea of trusting Albertans and, and people who, who own and operate small businesses, listening to them about what they need and how we can best support them and champion them. And one of the things was some of the, the COVID measures were done very short notice with no no consultation whatsoever with restaurant owners and then just slapping these uh, rules or regulations around them, le- leaving them holding the bag to, to enforce these things. And, and so, yeah, that was really frustrating is what I'm hearing from small business owners and particularly restaurants, um, coffee shops in, in Calgary Elbow. And so, yeah, that, that could have been done much better. And then I think moving forward, one of the things that the Alberta Party has, has put forward, and, and we're going to have a policy convention in the fall, um, Chris. So, I'm again, this next few months, I'm listening to the people of Calgary Elbow as to what's their priorities, what are their solutions, and how we can work together on those. And I'm inviting people to join us in the fall on the policy convention. Um, but certainly as a starting place, we, we can look at, you know, increasing tax deductions for, for small business and maybe even look at getting rid of the small business tax. It's not a huge, you know, it's an interesting, it's not a huge revenue generator for the province. And yet, as we know, small businesses are the largest job creators. So, yeah, I think there are some real tangible things that we can do uh, in making life easier and better for small business owners in uh, Alberta and in Calgary Elbow. Where do we go from here, though? Because mm-hmm. most people are hoping that the pandemic is behind us, even though it's not. Mm-hmm. I'm going to say that. Yeah. Oh, Carrie and I are socially distanced. We're yeah. two meters apart. Uh, it may not look like that on the camera. Well, and hey, but... I'm triple vaccinated, and I can't wait to get my fourth shot. Exactly. And, and if it means, you know, every six to 12 months I could get another vaccination, that, that's what I'll do as well, Chris. Exactly, and I'm the exact same way. Um, I want to know, how do we move forward from this? Because... We, we need to start living our lives. We need to start living, uh, trusting Albertans to make the, the right decision for themselves, as you said, mm-hmm. as Barry has said, Barry Morrissey, the leader of the Alberta Party. How do we move forward? Yeah, so again, I think what I'm hopeful about, you know, regardless of, of which parties in, in government and and certainly for, for Barry, I can tell you right now, Barry Morshita will be a value add to the Alberta legislature for sure, um, just in the way that he makes decisions. And, and for myself as well, there, I have a very deep commitment to just everything that we've been talking about, which yeah. is that consultative process, building relationships, listening to people in healthcare, you know, people on the front lines. When they're telling us that there's capacity issues and that there's burnout, we listen. Um, so yes, I think there's things on, on healthcare and moving forward. We start by listening to understand. And guess what? That also means listening to people who disagree with us. And that's hard. Having those hard conversations with with people. I'll give you just an example, Chris. So during during the pandemic, a friend of mine, and she's fully vaccinated, by the way, and so are her kids. And this is what she said to me. She said, Carrie, I'm scared to even ask questions about the vaccination because I feel like people will shame me or call me an anti-vaxxer. And I thought, that's not right. That's not right. This is not what we should be trying to achieve. So when I see people out there who want to shame or bully people to see things in their way in, in their from their perspective, even if you're taking a, a science-based, evidence-based good position, the way to bring more people to that is not by shaming and bullying them or, or making them fearful to even ask questions. That's nonsense. And so I think part of the way we move forward is extending more grace to each other having more conversations with people we disagree with, listening to understand, okay, where is this coming from? You know, for, for my friend, it's because she was genuinely, was fearful. She had concerns. She didn't understand the vaccination. And, and so that's not a, that's a, you know, that's good to ask questions. I, I hope more citizens ask questions when you're injecting something into your body. It's good to be well-informed and to have, you know, at least some understanding of, of 
why you would be taking this or why you would be injecting this into your body and how it works from a layman's perspective, right? So, yeah, so I think moving forward, we have to create space to get past this polarization because this has also impacted families and friends and people stop talking. We've got to get back to a space where we say, hey, you know what? I, I'm not sure that I agree or disagree, but I just want to hear you out. Where are you coming from? What are your concerns? And just listen to understand. And then, you know, have people in, in leadership positions that will share the best information possible. And again, it's not a perfect system. You know, democracy is not perfect. There's always that tension between majority rule... <laughs> whoever's calling the shots and and then minority or you know perspectives or views and I I think that's the always going to be the tension so whether it's the COVID pandemic or whatever issues we're going to face again or next um, and who knows what's next right I think if we've learned anything life comes at us fast We're, we're living in a world of accelerating changes and there can be all kinds of crises around the corner I think that we have to start to look at problem solving from from a different perspective and and I just I read a book um, think again by Adam Grant I don't know if you've read anyway what he's basically doing in his book is he's challenging us to engage in nuance and context and conversations to be willing to say hey I made a mistake and this is an opportunity to learn to not to be afraid of failure afraid of our mistakes but rather look at them as opportunities and and also, when we're going to have these hard conversations, to start from a place of asking questions. Just start with asking questions and listening. I think that's going to get us further ahead in terms of healing and finding practical solutions that will help us as individuals work together for a collective good, which is essentially what we have to do when we're faced with something like a, a, a global pandemic. <laughs> So I was going to go on some more policies, but you brought up a topic that's very near and dear to my heart, and that is the will of the the will of you versus the will of your constituents. Because as the next MLA for Calgary Elbow, you know and I know that you will not be elected by a hundred percent of the voters, unless for some <laughs> reason the, all the other candidates drop out and you get acclaimed it's not going to happen I, I hate to burst that bubble for you here <laughs> yeah. Gary right here right now but yeah. no part no person yeah. has ever won with 100 percent of the vote yeah. I, and, and when they do highly suspicious <laughs> exactly highly suspicious <laughs> exactly so I I've got to ask the question that is the 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 canary in the coal mine here is how do you balance what you want against what your constituents want because if the majority of your constituents come to you tomorrow and say i want this that and that stopped i don't want the reservoir going through this area i want it moved further away from us i don't want the curriculum to go through but you believe and we can talk about the curriculum later but i'm just saying hypothetically if you didn't want the curriculum but your constituents wanted the curriculum how do you balance that as the alberta party mla for calgary elbow how would you tell yourself, I need to vote for what my constituents want? And sometimes that means going against what I believe is true. Yeah. So, you know, so first of all, if, if I'm elected as the MLA, to me, when you're elected, you're elected to serve everybody, those who vote for you and those who don't vote for you. So would you be willing to talk to someone of uh, the People's Party? And I know they're a federal party, yeah. but people of the Wild Rose Independence Party. So sure. would you be able yeah. to sit down and have a conversation yeah. with them? Yeah, well, that goes back to the big tent hard walls. Yeah. Look, if, if it's about hatred and tolerance and that's the starting place, we're probably not going to accomplish much. If, however, it's just a difference in understanding, a difference of opinion, a difference in priorities, then absolutely, I will invite, I love to have those nuanced conversations. I invite, uh, because how would I ever learn anything new if I only surround myself with with people who think and see things the exact same way I do? So I will invite that. I I will look forward to that, Chris. So yes, I will be listening and meeting with people throughout the four years, including people who, who I may disagree with. Um, the other thing, though, that I think is important is two things, starting from a values-based leadership. And so what that, and that's what I'm going to be doing over these next few months, um, is, is connecting with people to understand what their core values are. Now, I've had, you know, good fortune, of course, with, with knowing Greg Clark, but also many others um, in Marta Loop and the other communities of Calgary Elbow, uh, we're really fortunate. We have a very high voter turnout, a very engaged, informed uh, constituents. 
And so I know they're going to challenge me. I know they're going to ask hard questions and I'm really excited about that. And so, so part of it is just connecting. I'm going to see, I'm going to put my values out there and I'm going to see if it's a match with, you know, many people in Calgary Elbow. So we'll start with what are your core values? The other thing that I've learned as a tribunal member is, you know, regardless of what the final decision is, and I have to, I've had to make very difficult decisions that have impacted people's safety, sometimes even their lives in, in terms of the risks they face in their home country. So very difficult decisions uh, that have human consequence. And so one of the things that I've always tried to do as a decision maker is to be fair transparent and fair and and to provide decisions with reasons so that means you're you're listening to to the two different sides for example if the minister is involved you're hearing and weighing evidence you're listening and then you're assessing and weighing the evidence to make a decision and so when people don't necessarily get the outcome they want or hoped for and understand that the decision making has been fair and transparent my experience has been as a decision maker people will still respect you. They will say, look, you know what? I disagreed and I can see how she came to that decision. And it was a fair process and I felt heard. And I felt like my priorities and concerns were heard and were considered before the decision was made. So that's also something that I'm deeply committed to. And, it, and it's a skill set that I bring um, to this role as well as an MLA. Now, on the flip side of that, though, mm-hmm. is what about working with other parties? Yeah. You, you talked about the Ask Her campaign, and it doesn't matter what party you're from. It's just nice to see women run for leadership mm-hmm. roles. If elected as the next MLA for Calgary Elbow, you might have to work with UCP members, uh, NDP members. What would you envision that looking like to ensure that the people of Calgary Elbow don't get forgotten, <coughs> but also their interest gets advanced because... I think people want someone who can work across party lines and is not so entrenched into thinking it's either my way or the highway. Mm-hmm. So can you talk about how you can work between with opposing parties and find a common good for the people that you might be representing? Well, that's something I'm really excited about, Chris. <laughs> you, yeah, you hit the nail on the head. I mean, it's part of the reason that I'm running as an Alberta party uh, candidate is it would be very difficult for me to... to step up into the role that you've just described, being able to work across party lines if I chose one side or the other right now because they are so entrenched and and so passionate about their teams. And so, <clears throat> pardon me, so I think it's um, a real opportunity if I'm elected to do just that. I see you taking a drink here and I'll just give you two <laughs> seconds here. So... <clears throat> I want to go back to some policy because I, I, I thank you for get, letting me go on that tangent yeah. with you about uh, working well, with uh, constituents who may not vote for yeah. you and people who who no. don't see eye to eye on you with for 100% you of the You know, issue. Chris, you just reminded me, um, and this was really interesting, so I just want to jump back a little bit to your earlier question because at the <laughs> launch, uh, a friend who's been an ardent UCP supporter came to the launch, by the way, and one of the first things he said to me, kind of accosted me actually, and said, Carrie, if it's a minority government and you're the Alberta Party MLA, will you support an NDP or a UCP government? What will you do? So number one, I thought, wow, this, this person actually thinks, you know, we have a chance here. We've got a real, a real possibility of winning. And, and I can see a path to earning the seat um, as an Alberta Party candidate. And that's, you know, it's, it's a real tangible path to earning that seat. On the other hand, it brings up that question of, okay, let's say we do have a handful of Alberta Party seats in the legislature, and we have maybe for the first time in Alberta's history, a minority government. I think the Alberta Party is very well placed, and me as an individual, as an MLA, will be very well placed to work across party lines, to find those commonalities. And I said to him, it depends. It really depends on the issues and the priorities what I hear um, from my colleagues in the legislature in terms of the direction they want to take our province in. I will work with them when we agree, and when we disagree, let it be for good reason, and then let's have further discussions about why we disagree. So I'm, I'm very open-minded, and it's an exciting space to be in because it's, it's very different than when you're with a, a, 
a very uh, a major party that has you know millions of dollars and I don't think anyone at this point in time should feel or believe that it's a shoe in for any party. Things are very volatile in Alberta politics right now. We're in a space of uncertainty and there's a lot of moving pieces. And so I would caution anyone to, uh, to be overconfident in terms of the outcome of the next election. If we were very confident about outcomes of an election, we would have we would have had Premier Danielle Smith in 2012. That's so right, yeah. let's be honest, anything can happen yeah, in a very can, short period yeah, of time. Yeah, you're so right. Anything can happen. Um, I want to get back to policy for mm-hmm. a quick second. Um, we are about to end the school year, mm-hmm. and uh, our kids are going to be off for summer break, and then they'll be going back to a new curriculum, somewhat of a new curriculum, in uh, September or end of August, beginning of September. Um, have you had a chance to read the new curriculum or the proposed curriculum? I haven't read it all through. Uh, Barry Morishita has, and I certainly will. Yeah. Um, I, what I have had the chance to do, though, is to listen to friends and family members. Is it an issue that you're hearing about? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So, really? Yeah, and you know, so I was actually just helping out my mother-in-law with a garage sale in Grand Prairie last weekend and listening to my brother-in-law, who's a teacher in Grand Prairie. It is a very big issue. Just imagine... The, what the last couple of years have been like for educators. It's just been unbelievable. I mean, we think about healthcare workers and also educators, what they've had to go through in terms of transitioning online, all of the health and safety concerns for themselves, their families, their students. I mean, unbelievable. So I think, again, back to this idea of trust and, and maybe even we'll call it respect. You know, again, let's get politics out of this. Let's listen to people on the front lines of education. And, and let's not just throw everything out for some kind of ideological you know, reason. I, I think it's actually quite disturbing uh, what's happened with the curriculum, with the lack of consultation and, and throwing out all the work that was done, by the way, not just under the previous government, but also previous progressive conservative governments. So I, I think you know, we need to get back to listening to experts in education. and. So I'm going to challenge you on yeah, that. Sure. I'm going to challenge you on that for a little bit here, Carrie, because Minister of Education, uh, Ariana Lagrange, would say, I've listened to experts. They might not be your experts. Right. They're my experts. And I think that's the one thing that a lot of people, and you say you want to listen to experts, but your experts might not be the ones that I want to talk to. Sure. So how do you know what expert is correct? Because you've said that word a few times, yeah, and sure. I want to make sure that people understand that what you mean by listening to the experts sure. because the UCP have their experts, the NDP yeah. have their experts, the Alberta party has their experts. What experts right? Who knows? Because they all have their leanings. Sure. So what experts are you talking about? Sure. And why aren't the current experts that are being on this advisory panel for the curriculum the correct ones? Well, I think we just have to listen to teachers, number one. Okay. So for example, when you when you have a curriculum that you want implemented, Who implements it? Teachers. And overwhelmingly, we're hearing from teachers that they don't support this curriculum. So, yeah, when I talk about experts, I mean the people who have to do the work. The people who've been doing it for for several years and decades who've committed their lives to being educators. They care about learning. They care about students. I mean, I'm not sure if you know this. I was a teacher myself. So so I can empathize with this. Extensive resume, everyone. (laughs) So, I mean, it is the, the... amount of commitment and time and energy that teachers put into their their students and learning and caring about them as as human beings and their development you know not just as as students i mean it's it's a lot of commitment and so those are number one those are the experts we have to listen to i mean the people that have to do the doing and then beyond that of course there are people who study education systems and learning methodology and get their masters and PhDs. Sure, I'm willing to listen to those folks too. And in addition to that, I also mean students and parents. Because guess what? Parents really, really care about their children's education. And, And education for all children, Chris. This is, you know, something that I'm also very passionate about is making sure that all children have the opportunity to fulfill their potential and to fulfill their dreams. And so that includes children with disabilities. That includes children with all kinds of neurodivergence, kids, I mean, 
And I think, you know, teachers do get that. I, I, I think there's a lot of good teachers um, out there. And I, I think that this demonization of, of uh, you know, people who are working in education or people working in healthcare has been a bit disturbing, you know, trying to throw people under the bus. I, that's not the right approach. I, I do believe there's a lot of really good, caring people in both education and healthcare. And that's why they devote their lives to those careers. So, yeah, when I say experts, when I'm talking about education, I'm talking about educators and parents and, and students. And then when I'm talking about healthcare, I'm talking about physicians and surgeons and nurses and EMS and paramedics and x-ray and all of the people, orderlies, all of the people who work directly in healthcare delivery. And as you know, there are, it's a multitude of people who work in healthcare. And, and by the way, Chris, I, I have to mention this because this is another thing that I'm very passionate about. Mental health treatment is healthcare. And so it cannot be an afterthought. It has to be a priority uh, going into to whatever, you know, sustainable health care looks like. It has to be a budget item. There has to be money, real money put into that. And it has to be made a priority. And I understand that the uh, progressive conservatives in Nova Scotia are doing just that. And so I'm very curious to learn more, again, listening to experts in mental health, to how we do that in Alberta, because we have some serious gaps and we've got to make sure that we um, address that. You, 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 I'm going to play in that field with you for a bit here. If you want to talk about mental health, I want to talk about mental health as well, because um, hearkening back to the COVID-19 pandemic, I was at an event uh, yesterday up in Airdrie with a UCP leadership candidate, and a woman was talking to me about her kids. They were struggling. They had lost their jobs. There was a lot of mental issues, the mental health issues that were going around, depression. Um, the last two years have taken a toll on a lot of people mentally. Um, this is not a quick fix. We can reopen tomorrow and it's still not going to be a quick fix tomorrow. You talked about what's happening in Nova Scotia. You talked about how mental health is health care. Would you be willing to advocate for a mental health strategy for this province to ensure that people would be able to get the proper treatments they would require or help that they would be required to get if elected? Yes, because it saves lives, Chris. We lose people to suicide. This is, we, 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 this is we're talking about people's lives, their well-being and their very lives. So absolutely, it is long past time to make this a priority. And so, yes, I will be very passionate about advocating um, for, for mental health as a healthcare, uh, just, you know, the brain is an organ. You know, I think the field of neuroscience has, has really uh, emerged and has evolved over these, the last, well, less than a decade. And so the treatment, there are real treatment and, and preventative and getting on the front end of things rather than on the back end of things, I think is, is, is the right way to go about it. So yes, absolutely. Um, I'm just cautious of time here because we're coming up to the whole hour mark. Oh if, my goodness! If, if you can't, well, you, if you can believe it, you we're and almost, I, we, I could talk with you all <laughs> exactly, day. Exactly, that's night, the great so, thing. Yeah. I literally just looked at the clock. I was like, whoa, it's almost, <laughs> it's almost been an hour. But I like I, we're gonna continue on with one last line of questioning, and it's gonna be an easy line of questioning, <laughs> and that is, we are in the red zone, as our my friend and I'm assuming your friend Dave Cornier would say, the red zone, which is a year from election day, unless the new leader calls it early election. Wouldn't that be something? <sighs> <laughs> like I said, anything can happen. Exactly. Anything can happen. What do you have to do between now and election day? Whether that be in May 2023, whether that be in 2022, who knows? What do you have to do between now and then to introduce yourself, but also get people to start thinking about the Alberta party in more of a serious alternative because Greg Clark was great. Uh, we saw what happened last election with the division and now there's a polarization. How do you get the Alberta party on the map in Calgary Elbow again? Yeah. So, so number one, it's about connecting with people. So, <laughs> so I will be laser focused on the people of Calgary Elbow and part of it's traditional door knocking, meeting meeting people there. Part of it's being at community events where people go where the people are. <laughs> so it really is about building relationships, connecting with people, hearing, listening, what their priorities and what's important to them, 
and earning their trust and then earning their vote. So that I will be laser focused. My number one job is to connect with literally thousands of people over the coming months, whether it be this fall or next spring. But I have one job, connect and earn the votes of the people in Calgary Elbow. And then of course, the other thing that I have to do, and we're making some headway on that, is, is fundraising to make sure that we have a locally fully funded um, campaign. So, you know, I think it's 53000 is the maximum we can spend during the RIP period. And I can tell you right now, we will have that. We will have a fully funded local campaign in Calgary Elbow. And I will do everything. I resigned from my position. I'm doing this full time. So I will do everything I, that I humanly can do to connect and earn the trust of as many people in Calgary Elbow as possible. So how does that look like? How can people get involved? How can people reach out? Because... Uh, I know when you know, campaigns need volunteers, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Can campaign need yeah. team members. Yeah. So how can people learn more about you? How can people reach out to you? And how can people, you know, let's put it this way, donate if they wanted to sure. donate to what they've heard tonight and say, hey, I want to throw $100 towards Carrie's campaign, so how can I do that? Yeah, so you can do donate locally right on the albertaparty.ca website, and you just go to Constituency Association Calgary Elbow. I'm doing all of the fundraising through our local uh, constituency association. So we also can take uh, e-transfers at Cal Cal dash elbow at albertaparty.ca. <laughs> uh, I'll get. I'll have to put that out. But albertaparty.ca is probably the easiest to remember, and you can go right to the Calgary Elbow local constituency association page. So that's probably the easiest um, way. I'm very fortunate too. You know, friends if it, and and acquaintances, if they're willing to host uh, coffee meeting, wine and cheese, whatever. Uh, Dr. Anthony Cook and uh, his wife Jennifer Cook, who's an author. Uh, are hosting event for me next week and inviting they live in Rideau and they're inviting uh, neighbors and so you know that's the thing I have to earn it and I'm prepared to do the work to earn it but albertaparty.ca and I'm also willing to share the best way to contact me is email and it's just my name kerrycundle at gmail.com and that's in the public space and so I invite anybody who wants to have a coffee or whatever let's connect that's that's what this is all about so I'm going to leave on this question and this is the million dollar question. Oh, okay. Why should you be the next MLA for Calgary Elbow? So, you know, I think in a nutshell, Chris, that, that is the million dollar question. Um, it's about who can you trust? Who is going to bring integrity? Who is going to bring compassion, some empathy, some fairness, uh, the ability to work, as you've said earlier, across the aisle with colleagues in the legislature? Who do you trust to listen to you over the next you know, four or five years uh, and to meet and to problem solve with you around your priorities? So I think I'm that person. I'm, I'm ready. I know. I've had all kinds of life experience, work experience. Um, I've served uh, a federal minister, so I know how hard it can be to prioritize and make tough decisions. And so that's in a nutshell it's it's if you want somebody who's hard working and honest and ethical and who will meet you where you're at and work with you and listen to you i'm your candidate um so that's that's why i think it's it's me because you don't have to worry about me in terms of those core values you don't have to worry about you know on on social issues i i'm i think i'm well aligned with the majority of albertans as well as the majority of people in, in calgary elbow and I think on, on economic issues, I, I will also be very well aligned in supporting our local businesses. So I, I think it's a really good fit. I, I've lived now for almost eight years in Marta Loop, and so I, I walk the sidewalks of Marta Loop and, and go to local businesses every day. And so I think if people are looking for an honest local candidate who's willing to listen and build relationships over the coming years, then I'm, I'm the person for the job. Perfect way to end this <laughs> interview. Um, Carrie, I want to thank you so much for this. This has been an honor and a pleasure as always. For those who are listening, for those who are listening uh, when it comes out via the audio, when we actually release it via the uh, pl uh, podcast platforms, um, the links to Carrie's email address, to the links to donate to the Calgary Elbow Riding Association will be in the show notes. They're not there right now for anyone who's listening to this via our audio stream and our video stream. Uh, they're not there yet. Uh, I wasn't prepared to <laughs> have that question answered, but here we are. Um, Carrie, I want 
want to thank you so much for doing this. This has been an honor and a pleasure, and I wish you all the best in the coming months, weeks, whenever the next election is called. Um, I wish you all the best. Okay, thank you, Chris. And thank you for what you're doing, too. I mean, independent journalism is so, so important. And as you can imagine, the work I've done, one of the first things dictators go after are the journalists. That's how you know democracy is fragile, when they start going after the journalists. And I see journalists as, as truth seekers and such a huge, huge contribution um, to a healthy democracy. So thank you for what you're doing. No, well, thank you. Um, as I said beforehand, the links to Carrie's information will be in the show notes below when this comes out uh, later on next week, which will be Tuesday next week, which is, if you're listening to this now, this is going to sound really weird. It's not Tuesday next week. It's now. Um, but... Have yourself an excellent rest of your day. Thank you for everyone who's tuned in during this. We had over 300 people tune in via the audio stream and the video stream. Um, Carrie, again, my pleasure. Likewise, Chris. Uh, For that, uh, I've been Chris Brown. I I am Chris Brown, the host of the Crossboard Interviews with Chris Brown. Have yourself an excellent day. And remember, guys, get out from behind social media for at least 10 minutes and go have a conversation (laughs) with somebody. I know it does hurt sometimes, but... You can actually help democracy a little bit. So with that, have yourself an excellent day. And remember, guys, keep talking.